Last day of a conference, always the strong survive, so thank you. Uh, Daniel Pionk, one of the founders of University Ventures, um, and you know, it's a relatively small group, so we're gonna try to make this pretty interactive and, and hopefully a little bit more entertaining than, than the average conference. And you know, I think what we, um, all of us here on the panel are, are passionate about is the fact that uh, the way med medical care is being presented is changing every day. And the hospitals, I mean, if anybody went to a hospital today versus 10 years ago, uh, you see a totally different uh, type of care uh, between electronic medical records to checklists and things that, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago didn't exist. And so, uh, and we're moving towards a point in time where computers are going to be better uh, uh, at um, evaluating sickness than humans, perhaps. So uh, we had a really incredible panel, and um, I'm going to kind of go down the, the list and ask everybody question that will hopefully allow them to introduce yourself so you don't get long introductions. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Dr. David Lenahan. Um, you know, America spends over $50 billion per year just on accredited training programs in the health sciences. Can you talk about how technology is going to reduce the cost of that education while hopefully improving quality? For me, in, in health education, quality is the most important thing. And the reason for that is people's lives are going to uh, sit in our hands, and it's almost a zero failure game. And mistakes just can't happen. The problem we're running into is that the cost of medical education and the cost of health education is going through the roof. The new medical school that's opening up in Texas is almost $600 million over budget. Hofstra, which opened up in New York, is $250 million. You go to Northwestern in Chicago, and you look, they got 80-foot marble ceilings with gold along the top. It's fantastic looking, but that doesn't solve the problem. We need to figure out a way to drive these costs down. And what technology is going to allow us to do is standardize the medical curriculum so that we can deliver it across the globe at a much lower cost while raising the quality. It's disruptive. I will tell you that medical school professors and clinicians don't like it, but it's the way it's got to go. And this is what my company has really focused on. We've digitized the curriculum. We brought in a lot of data analytics so we can improve the quality, and we're in the process of distributing this medical and health curriculum across the globe to a, a high standard. So, and, and Jane, uh, from your days as governor to today running uh, Ultimate Medical Academy, can you talk about how uh, you, you know you perceive outside of the doctor and nurse ranks how this is what changes you're seeing at sort of the more operational level, uh, more more technical levels in, in training uh, techs and other. Sure, and uh, just to clarify, uh, Derek Apinovich is here, who's the real president who runs Ultimate Medical Academy. I, I, I am uh, there for uh, support and a little bit of humor uh, on the side. Well, but, well, you're excellent at both of those things. So, <laughs> um, so for those of you um, who maybe are policy wonks or have older parents, I don't know if you're familiar with the term donut hole that was created in the Medicare prescription drug delivery system, but I think actually as you talk about the future of the um, medical workforce, there's actually a donut hole there as well. Um, and while you seek to um, find a way to more uh, efficiently educate doctors at the high end with innovations and technologies that hold tremendous hope for solving diseases and delivering services, you also have all these other demographic trends um, that are impacting where actual hands-on care is delivered, and that's where Ultimate Medical Academy um, is also leveraging technology to train students, but I think there are some really significant uh, trends and challenges that we need to be aware of. So um, the number of workers available to take care of our parents, and frankly, sooner than we want us, um, is shrinking. Um, so there are more people to take care of than there are uh, people to take care of them. Um, at the same time, because of some of these cost pressures, a lot of the care is being driven down the life cycle uh, further into the healthcare delivery system. And that workforce that's being asked to do more of the hands-on care at a perhaps lower clinical level um, is far more diverse um, than uh, the workforce that has traditionally delivered care in a hospital setting, in a nursing home setting. And so figuring out how you, uh, at scale, can deliver um, courses to folks with an associate's degree who perhaps have never been successful 
in an education sy system who have very different cultural norms than the patients that they're gonna be called on to serve and frankly, than the higher level education professionals uh, that they're going to be reporting to is the uh, issue that we're trying to address and that we've been able to leverage technology to solve, whether it's a PCT, uh, pharmacy tech, and then frankly in the broken health insurance system, um, having people who can code all the bills so that folks eventually get paid. Yeah. Uh. Well, we've gone deep into the abyss quickly. Uh, the structure of the panel, by the way, is two people who operate actual educational institutions, and then three who are leveraging technology to change uh, how people train for healthcare. So now we're going to switch to the technologists, uh, hopefully, uh, or at least curriculum providers and, and technologists. And Justin, can you talk about how technology is, is extending the reach of clinicians rather than uh, replacing them? Yeah, I think that from our perspective, we look at uh, technology-enabled education as a really powerful means to support both clinicians and patients. And so we look at it from a full ecosystem perspective of providing the highest quality, and the quality, as was mentioned, is an incredibly important element of this, in a for of highly clinically relevant and clinically practical information that is easily digestible and applied uh, on a just-in-time basis. And so we provide clinical education in one element. We, we've seen the, the data has come out in terms of it does improve outcomes. It's not surprising. On the patient side, uh, so much about healthcare, um, as you mentioned, was the demographics, the difficulties associated with all the challenges of speaking with patients. Uh, we do look at technology as a very powerful means to not only help the clinicians directly, but actually empower the clinicians to engage their patients more fully. Good example is so much of healthcare is about changing patient behavior. And that's something that's hard to do in an intermittent visit of 15 minutes once a month. So technology has the ability to provide education that's customized at the app level, at the patient portal level, that allows for engagement with the individual patient on an ongoing basis. A good example, we work in allied health arena. So one, one nice example is 80% of us, sadly, at some point will have lower back pain. Um, interestingly enough, uh, quite a few, few, few of us live a sedentary lifestyle. When you go to a clinician, such as a physical therapist or occupational therapist, uh, a lot of the time what you get is one visit and a piece of paper with hand-drawn uh, uh, stick figures. Um, and then they basically tell you, now I'd like you to change your entire lifestyle and life with that piece of paper, which will now conveniently go in between your car seat and the divider in your car, <laughs> and will never see uh, the day of light. Apps that are providing an ongoing daily dose are going to be able to enable our clinicians to extend their reach beyond the visits that they have approved, but also allow them to engage the patients on a daily basis, which actually increase activation and, and as well as utilization, as well as adherence. Now, there's not one panacea, so that's not going to be one click on for everybody. That's a one element that we see technology really helping to improve it. Back to the clinician side, what's interesting is by providing that adherence data, by providing that information back to the clinicians, it enables us to start to capture something that's not been captured. Believe it or not, in the realm of allied health, there really isn't a lot of information out there as to which exercises are best for actually improving which element of a diagnosis. So by providing the information back into, and what do we call it, I know we'll get into this later, uh, AI or some sort of uh, sophisticated database, but by providing the link linking of the EMRs as well as outcomes management systems, we're going to start to be with technology extending the reach of clinicians to be able to improve outcomes and continuously get a better understanding of what uh, diagnostics and which treatment protocols were actually improving outcomes. And that's the power of technology that's going to allow us to actually reduce the number of in-person visits, but at the same time actually improve, improve outcomes. Yeah, that's a great transition to Mary Ellen, who um, has, has a very interesting company that, uh, well, I'll let her describe it. So in, in thinking, but, but Mary Ellen, as you craft um, P2P and, and as you think about it, it, it improved patient outcomes, um, how do you think about the role team-based care plays in that? Uh, and um, is this the missing link as we're struggling to uh, get healthcare right as a nation? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, if you look at the healthcare system for decades and decades, it's about, been about building athletes, right? Individual athletes and not teams. And so when you have to have transformational change like this, it has to move across all stakeholders hopefully at the same time, not in a sequential, and we've really been in a sequential model, right? Accountable care, which is important, the government has to start. The reality is we've had ACGME come in at the training program level and really over force overhaul of that curriculum, which has been helpful. But now imagine you have 
Dell University, which is I think what you were referring to earlier, being one of the first ground up medical school that is training people in a multidiscipline. So actually their lecture halls aren't lecture halls, they're upside down classrooms. And they have a, in a team, much like in a business school, they have a pharmacist and a nursing student and, a, and an MD and may, maybe a surgeon and various different <coughs> fellowships at different levels of training work together to solve problems. Imagine when they come out to this workforce right now and how they're operating and it, like, what are Dell graduates gonna do when they go to Brigham and Women's in Boston? What's gonna happen? They're the young guys, they're not gonna make an influence. So who's working at that mid-level that's inside those hospitals? And that's really what we focus on, is really enabling physicians inside the hospital to be able to start to understand <coughs> team-based care and start to realize the importance of building community and empowering them to communicate together. When you think about emancipatory learning, these folks are brilliant folks, right? What you, what you need to do from your curriculum is capture emerging medicine, enabling them to keep pace without having to read the literature, distilling it down in a practical manner, but let them locally with their intellect apply it to their patients through Twitter-like and but HIPAA compliant sort of Slack-like capability so that they're talking to each other and they're build, all, all boats rise. So we have a dashboard where the um, department head uh, in the C-suite can see where they have challenges. It's de-identified so no one's, it's safe for the physicians to make mistakes in our platform but they actually know where their risks are and they can start to actively create Twitter exchanges that are based on their own intellect and start to educate themselves, right? And this is all micro-based learning, so it's on the fly. I can be at the dry cleaner, I can be at the center console in between patients. And now you're talking about helping them understand. Right now you can have a healthcare system like Ascension, 79 hospitals, five hospitals are horrible at heart, heart failure, and one hospital is one of the yes. best in the country. <laughs> These guys, first of all, don't know that they're the worst, and the guys that yeah. are the best don't know that there's people that are that bad. <laughs> Open up that communication in a, in a, in a healthy so way so they can communicate to one another. So these guys, when they have a patient like me with heart failure, can talk to this guy and get a consult for free in a safe way, share our files, much like you know Mayo did as the king of quality when they had that red box theory in the old days, right? This is, it's just about automating the ability to talk to colleagues across discipline areas that are fringe areas for you. If I have a patient that has had um, cancer prior, I need to know what drugs they were put on and how that might impact the composition of the heart and the state of the, of the arteries. And so how do you enable that to happen? It's technology. It's technology and that core clinical content that then can be brought to a personalized learning and patient-centric way. Yeah, I've learned not to get sick at Ascension Health Care, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's Man. one place you can. Yeah, there's one of 79. <laughs> if, check to make sure it's the yeah. one of 79 if you're going to have a heart attack. Um, but, you know, uh, Greg, you know, Mary Ellen, thanks for that vision from the future. Greg, you run probably the largest uh, single provider of content uh, in the healthcare education arena mm -hmm. to colleges and universities. Yes. Can you talk about how Ascend is moving and starting to use technology uh, in a world with analytics and measurement are becoming increasingly important and sort of uh, how you're making that transition to, to yeah, future Yeah, a, a sense success right at its size has been based upon the application of um, assessment analytics to all of its careers that it focuses on, and largely in healthcare. So think about nursing and allied health for purpose of this conversation. And the whole premise in the company is about accelerating time to competence. Um, originally, in the early formation of the company, that, that meant helping people pass their certification or licensing exams. When you think about accelerating time to comp competence from an employer's perspective, it's really about having somebody that's job ready and can onboard quickly. And so we try to understand the problems in these careers from an employer's perspective and then build products to do assessment all the way back to the early days of someone's journey um, <clears throat> into healthcare. So analytics can be applied in the admissions process where we do have a product that can be used alongside of the ACT or SAT to admit a student to a nursing program. Uh, that's one venue for it. If a school doesn't want to use that, they can still use that product to assess students that have been admitted to see whether they have the essential skills, math, and so forth, people to get through a program. Mm -hmm. And if they can't, then they can intervene quickly. And the primary part of the product is to do assessment throughout the two-year or four-year program in a nursing program. And at every step in time, we can predict through predictive analytics what the probability will be of that person ultimately passing the licensing exam. So along every step of the way, both the student and the faculty members getting a red, yellow, or green light about where their status is and I'm tracking progress. And that really helps with confidence. And then more recently, adding other tools like Nurses Touch 
and uh, some simulation tools were actually been able to help accelerate the process of onboarding uh, for hospitals that say it's usually a year to be productive as a nurse. We're trying to bring that down to six months. So that's the way we, we apply analytics across all of our healthcare careers and it's, uh, we continue to build, now being the largest company in, in the business, uh, the database and the data lakes that we use across these careers are pretty deep. And when regulators or licensing organizations are looking at making changes in the bodies of knowledge, we also benefit from them coming to us to look at our data and our analytics to help evolve the standards. And, and is the future here? Like, we're all tech bulls on this panel. Like, we all think, uh, you know, AI, you know, we're all, the singularity is nigh, as one of my colleagues says. Mm -hmm. Like, is the future here, Greg? I think the future is here, for at least for the assessment analytics we're doing, what we're focused on now, and now you're gonna get into this a little bit in terms of AI and machine learning. How can you improve further and accelerate the uh, creation of assessment items to improve your analytics? That's gonna benefit from new technologies. And more recently, uh, and I'll talk later about simulation, um, where we're using, um, rather than videos or, or live humans, we're using virtual humans. Um, to actually uh, train people and allow them to train um, without bias, and uh, you're going to come back to that as well. So there's some new applications of technology that better prepare people for jobs, because our customers are saying they want a 90% persistence rate in the program, 90% pass rate on the exam, and 90% job placement in six months after graduation. That's the triple aim we have as a company, and so the application of technology is pretty important in all of those areas. Okay. So yeah. I don't want to be the skunk at the yeah. garden party. B, 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 but, smelly. Um, <laughs> it, if the future is supposed to be bringing down the cost of health care, uh, making it easier for consumers to access quality and higher quality care, I, I would just put forth the premise as a consumer and somebody who still engages in policy, no, the future isn't here. Hmm. Yeah, M Mary Ellen, I mean, you're in hospitals. Uh, and just, you know, you're, you're in, all of you guys are in hospitals. So, like, is that middle-aged doctor and nurse going to change, or is, do we have to wait for the next generation? They, they do change, actually. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we're seeing in, in our product is that we have a 59% rate of improvement of both knowledge and performance, and most of the other antiquated products in the market are getting 3 to 5% increases. It's just about knowing adult learning and knowing how to deliver it through technology in a way that is gisty and sort of micro-learning and, and enables engagement with peers they're competitive by nature. If you set it up and they all want to flex their egos a little bit and if you enable that <laughs> to happen, you know, you have Twitter fire happening internally and that, that's the way emancipatory learning happens, right? Especially when you get people as bright as clinicians. So I, I, think, I think it is happening. I think more in terms of making transformational change, if you look at, you know, the medical specialty boards, they're still by specialty area and by profession. It's still way too segmented to make that change. So someone's gonna be in the hospital right now bridging across that, right? Somebody's gotta be making sure that they're, they're thinking not departmentally, right? They're organized as athletes in departments right now. And so we can bring technology all we want until we learn how to bring them all together and identify how you play left wing, I play right wing, and someone is in the center and we know what that means. Right now, they don't have the right incentives. Like we need payers involved, we need reimbursement rates. You know, there's so many That's more That's complicated. Changes. How do we solve simple problems? You're smirking, Dave. I see a lot of smirking coming well, from Well, two left. smirks. One, I, I can tell that America <laughs> has changed because the reference was about soccer <laughs> and not about baseball. I thought it was hockey. Oh, I thought it was hockey. hockey or soccer? I think it was hockey. But, um, <laughs> All right, well, fair enough. But I would, I would use first base there's, and third there's base. There's no soccer teams. In but I think, I think what we're seeing in the ACGME and the residents and this is from a medical perspective, is the younger doctors who are going into, into these are more adept at handling the EMR mm -hmm. and those things. And people like me, I don't want to know that crap, right? Uh, just someone else can do that. It's yeah. tough to change the old guy like me. But as that starts to change, the younger ones come in. I think they're more willing. You'll see the orthopedic more communicate with the ER docs and the nursing staff. And so you get a little bit more integration. I don't think we're there yet, but I think the trains left the station. I, and I would and I would, just, I would, one thing I want to add just real quick is um, I think we look at it from the perspective that there's a technology which is there for a lot of the pieces, but in order for, I think what we're really dealing with right now, because we deal with both patients as well as clinicians, is 
making sure we look at it at a multivariate analytic approach. It isn't simply like, here's the technology, go use it. It's gonna be based on demographics, even down to the level of severity of a patient's condition, is making sure that as we build out the technology, and I think we're all focused on this, is making sure we're also taking into account the kind of crazy factor of they're humans. And every human is gonna embrace it in a very different way. So I think that what we see happening in terms of and how we look at the world is this educational ecosystem of clinicians, patients, and uh, obviously the continuum of care. But the, the different elements that are approached to it, I think that you're right, I agree with the, the incentives aren't there right now. Incentives do change behavior, but we've gotta meet the patients and the clinicians halfway and really understand how they work and they operate because you can't just shove an EMR on someone and say go to it. You've gotta provide the incentive and understanding of how their work streams work. And even in the world of EMR, we've heard the, the term a lot, it's like whatever product you make, make sure it's, it's got what's called low keyboarding. And that basically right. means make sure you're basically mm -hmm. taking into account that every clinician, every time you put a new great technology in front of them, they run the other way saying, oh my gosh, now I've got a new tool that I'm gonna be measured by, I've got a new tool that I'm gonna be looked at from the perspective of I'm not or I am doing this. So I think that the technology as it continues to grow is one element, and I think we're getting there. Um, I think that we still have a long way to go in terms of making sure that the, the users are embracing it. Greg, you're about to jump in, oh sorry. No, I was just gonna ask David, you know, we, we talked to some of our medical school customers and a lot of them moving towards this kind of IPE or interprofessional mm -hmm. right, education. I thought you might wanna just say something about that. Is that a trend that's just starting and is that gonna be enabled by technology or, or not? It'll definitely be enabled by technology. Okay. And the reason why is it'll allow you to distribute the experts in the field to a much larger range of clinicians and nurses or mm -hmm. whoever it happens to be. So you'll be able to distribute that content. That's actually what we do is we get the best lecturers, we get them in a, in a medium where we can exploit their skill sets out to a much larger population across the globe. But I wanna say one thing, and I know it's great that Elon Musk wants to send somebody to Mars and build rocket ships and do all that stuff. That's fantastic, <laughs> America and the world needs that. But this is the problem of the last millennia. How do you improve healthcare for the globe? How do we understand cultural competency? How do we do this at a cost effective rate? We've been struggling with this for thousands of years. And so, and I think the time is now, the technology is starting to be here to where we can now take that step, where we can make sure that that patient in Uganda and wherever around the planet can get the same quality of care. And I think we're the, hopefully we're the leaders making that step happen. And I'm, I'm, I am excited about that much more than sending a car to the moon. <laughs> but that was a really cool car. Mary, I cut, cut <laughs> you off cool a little car. bit. So. Yeah, well, I just wanted to comment on what David said earlier because I do think, um, I, I think there is a way to bring the older guard along. And, and I, I think in education, organization of curriculum is key to making it relevant. And so when I look at what hospitals are doing in terms of documentation and reimbursement and forcing their physicians to go to a day of documentation and they act like you or I would at a sexual harassment course, right? You're in your iPhone, you're doing everything but listen to it because it doesn't pertain to me. So what we're doing is we embed that with their knowledge, with their clinical. So you get up to synthesis and judgment, you start with knowledge, you're up at synthesis and judgment, you're going through a, an interactive case study, and when you come out, say, here's your documentation and coding tips. And our physicians are eating the dog food left and right. They're t plugging in. So if you get them documenting right, you know, the goal is, is to try to, there's a huge chasm between um, the old guard and the new guard, right? And, and you know, you're right, they're coming out knowing how to do EHRs, but they don't have the depth of clinical training anymore because they've jammed all this EHR curriculum See? in the same amount of time. We have to work to bring those two groups together, and I think it's about the organization and thoughtfulness of curriculum and making sure that I'm digesting it in a way that's irrelevant to me and my patients. Yep. Uh, uh, Jane, I, I want to change topics a little bit. You <coughs> mentioned uh, um, diversity in the workforce, and, and especially at the level that you guys operate with Ultimate Medical and, and the tech, tech world. And you know, how do we diversify, and, and there are all these studies that show that uh, quality of care is driven, and, and reimbursement rates to, sorry, is driven by having culturally competent uh, healthcare professionals mm -hmm. in, in front of you, and everyone probably in this room knows how, that we have fewer Hispanic doctors as a percentage of our medical care than we did 20 years ago, which is astronomically backwards to me. Um, can you talk about how you build a more diverse pipeline um, into the medical profession? So I think there's, um, first of all, I think there's a whole bunch of ways, and again, it's that donut. So um, our, um, 
our students, about 15,000 across the country, entering probably their first uh, step into uh, the more white collar workforce and uh, convincing them to do that in allied healthcare is not a um, really big uh, sales job because they get that there's lots of opportunity there. Our typical of our 15,000 students are single African American mothers, um, but they haven't had a lot of success in the workforce. And so um, I think all the technology is great and we can deliver actually our uh, courses by and large through technology, although some of those direct care uh, positions need to have touch. But there are all kinds of things like what Angela Duckworth was talking about yesterday about persistence and grit, but also just things that all of us who are sitting at this room, and I dare say every single person who's attending this conference take for granted that we teach our children every day, that you have to sort of back up to people who haven't been successful. And if the biggest challenge, which I agree with you, one of the biggest challenges facing um, our world is how to deliver healthcare. One of the biggest challenges, frankly, facing our country, which is also healthcare, but the other side is income inequality. Um, and our education system, and I know you guys write about this a lot, has done a really good job with my kids. Uh, mm -hmm. basically because I know how to work a really transparent system for my kids and a really crappy job in closing the achievement gap. And so how you take folks who haven't been successful mm -hmm. in education um, and get them not just the very specific skills to pass the licensure yeah, test to right. get them the credit hours, mm -hmm. but then to be able to go into an office setting that they've never been in before, talking to people, not understanding the norms, is I think a very different type of education that frankly, and yeah. uh, most of the people I know in government, this is, might be the most shocking thing I say all day, are really good people who are very well intentioned. <laughs> ah! um, oh, sorry. And uh, in a very also broken system. Um, but um, you know, we haven't done a great job responding quickly in our education system to the innovations. And uh, until recently, we've tried to kill the institutions that can respond quickly but we do as much sort of one-stop shopping for social services as we do delivering education quality and figuring out, you know, if you don't have childcare that's dependable, if you don't have transportation that's dependable, if you don't have those uh, other skills, it's gonna be really hard for you to be able, uh, and frankly, if you don't pay any more uh, than what you would make at Walmart, uh, in a much more demanding, much more difficult job, how do you, um, you know, convince somebody to take on that role? Yeah, it's on one hand the most cynical, most optimistic statement of the day. It's, it's uh, a, Greg, you know, you know, comment. I can't address the physician supply. We certainly can talk about nursing, right? Um, as I mentioned earlier, this idea of assessing people on the way into a program on chances of success, and, and we are going to be rolling out a grit test in combination with our admission exam for nursing. Um, but that still leaves the challenge we have of many of our urban schools uh, that are saying they, they don't have enough persistence in the program. And so we've been able to adapt the, um, the admission exam in a way that can allow the schools to offer conditional acceptance below a certain score. And then through the assessments that we can do, get people the right remedial uh, education early in the program. And uh, to the extent we've been able to be successful there with this triple 90 aim that I mentioned in the state of California with one of our larger customers, they're the largest supplier of bachelor's degree nursing students um, in the state of California. And they all come out of urban high schools and you might consider whatever term you want to use, underserved students in this case. You know, 2.0 students out of high school that are now becoming nurses. So very, very diverse student population. Mm -hmm. And then to top off that education with the simulation techniques we talked about, by, through the use of virtual humans and simulation, they can start to get the interactions uh, with, with humans even before they get to an office and actually practice a bit um, and learn how to deal with, with bias both directions in mm -hmm. terms of talking to a patient. So that's how we're making the contribution to bring a more uh, diverse workforce. But as Jane mentioned, when I go to those schools and talk to some of the students, those schools generally have social workers at the school because the challenges a student face, transportation, can I get to the school? Right. I've got a, I'm a single mother in my some cases. I've got, a, I've got taking care of my parents, uh, maybe a sibling, and then how do you get through a nursing program when you have additionally sometimes a part-time job? And so, you know, we can only support the aspects of learning as I described, but the school itself has to make some additional investments in, I would say, social care in order to make that transition. But Dave, where you're having success, I think that is where the upper uh, levels of healthcare can, as we 
could get true career paths and allow the private sector to be as much a participant right. in yeah. that as sort of the articulation agreements that always exist on paper that never get implemented in the state university mm -hmm. and college system, I, I think does hold promise. I, I, one of the most innovative things I've seen in terms of the medical school admissions process is a master's program that Dave, you've kind of pioneered uh, both at Toro and now at Ponce. Can you talk about that master's program, what it means, what the results are? Yeah, so I want to start off by saying why is culturally competent physicians important? We've all talked about why we do it, but Having culturally competent physicians actually impacts the reimbursement rates of hospitals, patient satisfaction. I know we don't like to talk about money when we talk about healthcare, but the reality is that drives the situation. About six months ago, I had to have heart surgery. So I went into the hospital. Well, was it an extension uh, hospital? It was not an extension okay. hospital. <laughs> uh, United Healthcare. But I went, I went into the hospital. The doctor walks in the room and he says, Dave, you have some blockage in your heart and we need to do surgery. In that room is my wife and me. So he comes in and tells us that, fair enough. I walk into a patient in Puerto Rico where the patient has exactly the same physiology, blockage of the heart. I'm gonna tell the patient that they have blockage. There's 30 people in that room, right? Grandma, grandpa, uncle, nephew, next door neighbors, the cousins, they're all packed in this room. Now medically, what we do to that patient is exactly the same. But culturally, how you handle that patient is significantly different. Now, I'll give you an example, touching the patient. I'm an Irish Catholic boy from the Midwest. You do not touch me unless you absolutely have to, <laughs> right? Because it's just not part of me. But in Puerto Rico, with some of the Latin culture, you have to be willing to hug. You have to be willing to embrace and have that. That little bit is worth almost $300 billion to the US economy in understanding that cultural aspect. Mm -hmm. And so getting culturally competent physicians, the healthcare systems are starting to realize that that's an important part to their healthcare delivery system for their reimbursement rates. And by the way, and how do you build that into your assessment? Because I know very few, so I have a freshman in college and two juniors in yeah. high school, and one of them is thinking of going into the medical profession, mm -hmm. and it's not because um, by the way, she wants to do technology. Um, it's right. because she has juvenile arthritis and she's been impacted by really mm -hmm. good doctors. Mm -hmm. And they're really good because they make her feel better, but they also take her seriously. Yes. Uh, they relate to her. And so the very things that we actually assess aren't necessarily always the things that completely add up to quality. So, so we should be able to figure this out. I, I've said this to a lot of medical school deans in private, because we don't say this, I won't say who they are, but I'm like, we're supposed to be smart people. We're supposed to figure this crap out. Mm -hmm. And we haven't done a good job. We all fight for the same 50 black students who scored a really high MCAT score. And then we can say, hey, look at how many minority students we have in our class. That's bull crap. We're supposed to be the leaders at, at figuring that out. I, I think what Daniel was talking about is we created a system where we take students who maybe didn't do very well in their freshman and sophomore year of college. Maybe they got a few C's. And these tend to be students from socioeconomic backgrounds that are a little bit depressed. We bring them into a master's program and we feed them as if they were first year medical students. And using data analytics, mm -hmm. we're able to compare them to how the medical students do. Yep. We take those students who do well and bring them into the medical school. So it's kind of a try before you buy yep. approach. Yep. It stops the student from incurring hundreds of thousands in debt, keeps the cost down, and we get to select students we know that can make it. That's how using data analytics since creating a master's program, that's how we were able to increase our URM, That's minority, black, Hispanic, American Indian. That's how we were able to increase our numbers from about 3% to 35%. So we take students that all the other medical schools say, ah, you're too high of a risk, we don't want you. We take those students and get them through the boards at a higher pass rate. And I think that's how, at least my contribution, how we help improve the healthcare delivery system in the United States. And, and what are the results of that program? Uh, and I touched him. So, <laughs> We're, we're, so I, we, when, I, when we took over, they were having about a 65, 68% pass rate. We changed the system, so we started selecting our students like this, mm -hmm. and our pass rate's running about 93% now, which That's is, terrific. you know, it's, it's not Harvard. Harvard, you know, has a 100% pass rate because they're taking the top 0.1% of the planet. Right. Great, good job, well done. We're taking students that they're not taking and getting them up to where they're all becoming doctors and they're all going into the health system, and they're all going into communities where we actually need doctors. We have enough doctors in Long Island, 
you know, that's, that's great, but we need doctors willing to go into Harlem and Detroit and right. East St. Louis. Right. Mary Ellen, you were about to say Yeah, I, I mean, I think congratulations, that's awesome. And I think that's incredibly important. I think I still wanna talk about that metal group in the hospital that aren't gonna go back and get that degree, right? And so this time I'm gonna be smart enough not to mention the hospital, but a major hospital that we all know and love that is not Ascension, <laughs> um, had this big mission to impact their diversity. They were, they were, this is an institution that you would not think has this issue, and they have the issue in a severe way. And it was impacting their reimbursement intensely. And so what did they do? They set a couple physicians and said, build the curriculum and, and, and put it in our Blackboard uh, LMS, and we'll make everybody engage in it. What do you think the results of that were? Well, it was Blackboard. That's exactly Zero. Well, Blackboard yeah, yeah, is use black, use Canvas or instruction. <laughs> yeah. But the point is you have people that aren't educators. They don't understand right. adult learning. They right. don't know how to develop a curriculum in a way. They don't need to in, know how to embed it with curriculum that is truly meaningful for them to say, now let's put this patient as an African as a, you know, and move through in, in different scenarios so that it's clinically relevant to them. And so, you, it, again, it's that, it's that thinking about holistically about the clinician and how they have to experience their education and trying to motivate those people that are done getting degrees that are taking care of our patients every day. So with the General Assembly announcement, at this conference, if you haven't bumped into a coding boot camp, you haven't been here. So everybody's talking about technology, coding, blah, blah, blah. How come we don't have that in healthcare? Geez, silence. Mm -hmm. We do, we do have it with the EMRs, I guess. There's yeah. a bunch of people coding that I don't understand what they're doing. But I, I guess we do have it. It's just hidden a little bit more. You mean, so, you mean when you say don't have it, mean like a complimentary? Well, uh, why, why, why isn't healthcare at this conference, healthcare boot camps, just as prevalent as General Assembly, Galvanize, Full Stack, all the rest? Accreditation. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, some, highly, of, the, some of these programs highly. are three months or six months long. They have to be accredited programs. It's also, if you think about it, it's the tip of the iceberg, you know, uh, there uh, is a really, Stanford leads a transformational change with, in medical education. It's all doctors there. It's really only been recently that they understand we're really not educators. We're academicians, but we're really not educators. We know our science inside and out, so how would that happen, right? How, how would that happen? It it's, can't happen. It's regulation and accreditation. Yeah. It, yeah. I won't make Derek take his like shirt up with the scars on your back from right. going through that accreditation process. And, you know, uh, Alexander's like thousands and thousands and thousands of pages uh, of justification for why you're doing what you do well and right. I suspect the uh, Coding Bootcamp folks don't have the patience for that. Yeah, no. Um, so we've got 10 minutes left. I've got a ton of questions. Are there questions from the audience or should I keep going here? I'm going to keep going. Dave said one of the most controversial things on our pre-call. <laughs> You want me to say it? I don't know. Yeah. Do you feel comfortable yeah. saying yeah, it out loud? Go ahead. So, do we need to worry about gender equality in healthcare? So he only said that because I wasn't on the call. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. So we all know that there's more men in healthcare than women right now, right? However, if you start looking at the entrance numbers, there's significantly more women in medical school than men. If you look at the UK, it's even larger. And if you look at the doctors under the age of 35 in the UK, the women earn substantively more than the men. Do we have to worry about the pendulum swinging too far the other way? And the other thing you said, which was I thought we were going to mention, is uh, bilingual doctors in the US get paid more. Right. So, so the, the other part to that is that culturally competent aspect to healthcare. Mm -hmm. Health systems are starting to recognize the value of that. And so what we see in the Midwest, I'm a Midwestern boy, is that if you do an ER, after residency you do your ER training, you're probably making about 275 to 300 a year. However, if you speak Spanish or you speak a different language or you're in Minneapolis and you're Arab, you speak Arabic for the Somali population, you make about 375. Mm -hmm. So you make more money. And the reason is the healthcare systems know that that skill set is going to yield a higher reimbursement rate for them. So they're willing to pay more money than they would a white guy like me practicing in those areas. I, I think that that's, that's business 101, but that is definitely happening. And that actually, that's one of the reasons why I think Puerto Rico is probably the most important state for the US healthcare system that we have. It produces 40% of all the new bilingual physicians entering the US market. 
So it's not just a supply and demand issue that's driving the salary. You're saying there's actually evidence of higher reimbursement if you look at yeah. the data. Yeah. Okay. So if, um, if you're worried about gender equality in terms of the most privileged, most intelligent um, women in the country, which are my daughters, not me, when I was growing up, then the answer is no. And there's actually some great data. Uh, and I'm sure there are issues impacting women uh, who enter the medical profession and become doctors, but there's actually great data that shows that because of the constricted supply that the medical schools um, participate in, the fact that there have increasingly over the last several decades been more women entering the profession, the profession has actually changed pretty substantially to accommodate more what has happened for women. So there are many other professions uh, that have uh, a lot further to go than the medical profession at the highest ends of achievement. However, and this is my pet peeve, I think um, we far too often, and this is totally off base for this uh, particular panel and conference, but if one more person focuses on a Princeton graduate or an HBS graduate or a business school and Harvard trained doctor as the issue facing gender equality, I'm gonna take my shoe off and throw it at them, which I learned from somebody in Iraq. Uh, that's not where the problem is with gender equality, it's people without power. It is the fact that if you um, need to take maternity leave, you are far less likely to get maternity leave if you're the CNA or the PCT mm -hmm. or the medical mm -hmm. billing and coding yeah, specialist right, right. than if you are the surgeon yeah. at Mass General. Right. And we spend all this time as a media and an industry yeah. talking about whether or not Jane Swift's kids are gonna be well served because she decides to be governor at the same time right. that she's having children. My kids largely are fine, they're teenagers, so we have little <laughs> issue. But it is the exact wrong issue, the gender equality issues within the medical profession that we need to worry about is how are you a CNA when you have three kids at home, when you might be able to complete your degree online because you have some flexibility if we wrap services, but then um, there were compelling stories from, from our students in a hurricane, Walmart closes, the hospital and the nursing home doesn't, your school closes. If you're doing direct line health care provision mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you have no child care, you have no backup care, those are the places we have to worry about gender equality. It is the women without power and other underrepresented minorities in every institution, not folks at the high end. Yeah, Sorry, I'll get off point. my No, no, it's interesting is it's at the absolute level for CNAs and home health aides. Yeah. Is that right. whether you work at McDonald's or you work at uh, an institution that uh, you're a CNA, it's not just gender inequality. It's, that's just a very, there's a whole other issue here we probably don't have time to talk about is is elevating the salaries of people that are changing the bedpans that are actually doing this type of very, very difficult yeah, right, work. Right. It is interesting though, to your point, uh, it, it, I live in the allied health arena and I do know that they, you know, there's stats, stats, and damn stats. Um, and I'd say that uh, for physical therapists, there was a report um, put out a couple years ago that did indicate we still got a long way to go. Um, women are predominantly, it's basically uh, two times more women are physical therapists than men. Um, and on average, their salary is about 15% lower. So we still have, well, maybe the stats come out on the other side for, for med other medical professionals. I think other areas within mm -hmm. medicine, we still have a ways to go. Okay. Uh, we have, we have an expert on this in the audience. Well, yeah, you're right. It's interesting too because I, I love where you're going because the issue is further compounded by the number of seats in just physical therapy. The number of seats in physical therapy programs across the U.S. has not changed in roughly 10 years. Wow. It is harder to get into the University of Washington, I'm from Seattle, University of Washington program, the 5% acceptance rate. It's harder to get into the PT program there than it is to get your Harvard MBA. 
And that's that's a dis there's <laughs> there's there's just not well, enough. Well, try to get well, into a nursing school when we have a nursing yeah. shortage. I mean, but but fundamentally, right. underlying all right. this is we yeah. don't have the that's pathways possible. created in healthcare. And we right. talk a lot about how do you create how do you create the the pathway for somebody from CNA all the way to advanced practice nurse. How do you take someone? And that's why I think the master's program that Dave did is so innovative. Like, oh, all right, half the students go to medical school, but half the kids go to other schools, and right. you create not just the direct admit to medical school, but you're out there creating a direct admit to nursing school for some portion of the community, or physical yeah. therapy, or other things, where you can actually help guide, and how do you bring that earlier, right? You're, this is, this is post-grad. How do you bring that to sophomore year, junior year? Because your ability to get into medical school is defined by organic chemistry, which <laughs> is, like, who cares? Who at, who, raise your hand if you ask your doctor what you get in organic chemistry. I mean, that is not on the agenda. So um, we have, uh, I just, if there are one or two other questions, I saw a couple other hands, so I just want to make sure we, you, you have, we have a, you're the expert I was going to call on for, oh, okay. for. Full disclosure, we're an investor, so I kind of knew I had a ringer in the audience. <laughs> Does anyone want to take that? I, mean, I, I, mean, I can start. I mean, we're heavily involved through a National Health Career Academy um, with these allied health positions um, and can provide those ladders for people to move through different certificates. Um, but uh, I, th I think as part of that, that program, we do work with the uh, career technical schools and the high schools to try to begin to offer those programs early on have those students identify with the attractiveness of those jobs as entry level positions, but also knowing that you could move through those jobs to other careers, right? CNA, right? Become an EMT, paramedic, eventually maybe a, a health sciences program or medical school. We have examples of that. It's rare that you'd make it all the way through that, uh, that ladder, but at least we try to begin educating people in the, in the high schools for that, and we partner with uh, high schools, both on the public side and the private side to do that. And you're I sitting right next to the person that works on that for me. <laughs> I, I, would, I would add to what you just said, something that my daughter happens to be in a nursing program, BSN program at Belmont, mm -hmm. which they service. And so one of the things that they do is they work with Belmont not just to tell a nurse that she can't make it. So my daughter is one of those kids that went to a small private Catholic school and didn't have strong sciences. And so here, but she has congenital heart disease, open heart surgery, and really committed to being a nurse. And the school has made this commitment. So Greg's tools give them insight on how do I talk to Jamie? How do I, how do I help Jamie? How does she learn? How do I give her the skills? It's, it's not to say, Jamie, you can't make it. It's to say, Jamie has this background, and how do we put the support system around him? And Belmont is known to have that program, and it's really the partnership with them that has, has helped them deliver on that promise to their students. I don't know if that's helpful. Best last word. Who's got it? Jane, Dave, Justin, who's got it? What are we going to call it? Go ahead, Jane. Yeah, I just, we have to figure this out. I mean, yeah, we, we have we um, too See? many great brains and too much investment not to. Yeah, I mean, and the human body is the same everywhere. And, uh, um, you know, one of the things that really drives me nuts is we, we don't use our talent. Uh, and we have so many unfilled, we have more than a million uh, unfilled nursing jobs alone mm -hmm. in this country. So. Um, this is a problem that needs to be solved, and appreciate everyone coming. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank the panel, and uh, get home safe. <laughs>